I'm Kumar from Under Edge. Today I'm going to be interviewing Sueto Kinch, the amazing man behind the legend of Mike Smith. Yo! <laughs> Hi Sueto! Hey Kumar! <laughs> How did this John ZD collaboration come about? Well, I don't know if you're familiar with John Z's work. He's somebody who pioneered hip hop theatre really in this country yeah. with a piece called Aeroplane Man. Somebody who's really one of the first, including Benjamin and a handful of others, to put hip hop before the culture on the stage. Yeah. He also curates something called Breaking Convention, which is a, a big international dance event that happens here in Birmingham, in London, yeah. all around the world, in fact. So we started working together when I decked for a great musician called Jason Yard back in 2001. Yeah. Um, and since then, we've been kindred spirits. He's been aware of my work and, and vice versa. And he's really inspired a lot of you know, subtext and songs and individual things on the albums. This is the first time that we've worked together in such detail. You know, he's been the director and choreographer of this piece, but also even before the album was recorded, The Legend of Mike Smith, on, on which this play is based, you know, we spoke about the story, the journey, and all those kind of things that from a theatrical point of view have to make sense. So why did you pick The Seven Deadly Sins as a topic? Um, I really like having themes and concepts to channel my verses. It's something that stylistically I want to push myself, uh, lyrically I want to push myself, so I found it was a really good template in which to do that. But also, anyone who knows my beats, the music that I make, yeah. I've been fascinated with the sound of classical music and hip-hop together, yeah. for rock and classical music for a while, and I wanted to contrast an arcane story something from Dante or you know, Christopher Marlowe, something like that, yeah. with a very modern world, so that they would to do. Also, you weren't inspired by the Bible at all? Well, interestingly, yeah, but the seven deadly sins are nowhere in the Bible. Yeah. You know, the fruits of the spirit are in the Bible. Yeah. You know I mean, all sorts of spiritual discussions in the Bible. The seven deadly sins is a very Catholic, very church-made, and certainly a very man-made concept. Yeah. And so uh, I find it particularly resonant in these times that if we live in, a, as we live in a supposedly secular age, yeah. I think the same forces are still at work. How do men create guilt? Yeah, do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. To control people, to coerce people, to do certain things that they wouldn't do if they weren't guilty. Of yeah. So, when it comes to the seven deadly sins, do you think that they, they, they should be called like the destructive sins because they're more close, that close in on you over time rather than straight kill you? Yeah. Um, uh, either way, they affect the end results of death, if you want to call it a literal death or spiritual or mental death. Uh, and I think, yeah, it's very interesting to me. I think there has to be something attractive and natural about all of these things in rehearsing and, and researching and writing the piece. I had to think, well, if you we weren't lustful, none of us would be here. Our parents would have been lustful. If we weren't greedy, perhaps we would have starved as a species years ago. Gluttony, you know, it's natural for people to. Uh, celebrate their success. So there is something truthful and seductive about each of these things. What the issue is, is how much our culture distorts and warps natural impulses and turns them into something completely unhealthy. Why do you make hip hop? Um, why does a tap dance a tap? Why does a painter paint? I love hip hop culture. I've grown up in it. I've been emceeing since I was 11. For me, the twin art forms of jazz and hip hop grew up in tandem. Uh, in love with hip hop, in love with jazz at the same time. Groups like Tribe Called Quest and Far Side, they were really influential in terms of seeing how you could blend hip hop and jazz at that time. Because jazz is actually described as an African American classical music. So do you think that hip hop is kind of the very backbone? Is of quite a sophisticated. Um, it just has quite a sophisticated backbone. It's an interesting subject matter. I remember talking to Wilton Marsalis and him and it to respond to that thing. 
American, it's jazz American classical music. No, jazz is jazz. It's his yeah. own idiom, it's his own tradition. And, you know, his dad never called it classical music growing up. It, it's jazz. It's come out of a specific cultural experience, as has hip hop. You know, the fusion, the, the, the collision, if you like, of immigrants like Latino and West Indian people like Cool Herc coming yeah. to DJ in New York created this new phenomenon. So you had turntablism and the toasting and dub culture in Jamaica colliding with funk in the dozens in America and producing what we refer to now as hip hop. Yeah. You know, all we refer to as MC. Um, I think, that, having thought about this a lot, it's often a commercial capitalistic energy which comes in and says, it's this, we need to give it a stamp so we can package it and sell it. You know what I mean? For me, this is far more about the continuum of African expression yeah. that's happened millennia ago, from griots to calypso to reggae to, you know, it's part of the same cultural exuberance, if you want to call it that, that's produced all these incredible art forms. Because it's quite a spiritual experience, that's what, um, John Coltrane used to call it, you know, it's very spiritual. Do you think hip-hop is an art form based on originality or is it a hybrid that allows you to combine the relevant elements that eventually become yours through reinvention? Great question. I mean, it's really hard to start from the framework of is hip-hop this, is hip-hop that? Yeah. Because it's a genre, it's open to classification, actually it's open to opinion. Yeah. Um, if you deal with the practitioners, the innovators, the people that made hip hop culture, Africa Bambata, uh, Cool Herc, as I mentioned, Grandmaster Flash, Buddy Mel, then you're asking really, what was it about them and about their integrity that inspired other people to try and do the same, to try and emulate it? Um, and as I said, that's connected to a much longer vein of African expression. Um, but yeah. For me, it is a lot to do, to direct answer to your question, to do with originality. And the same is true in jazz as well. The demand to study what's come before you, to be steeped in what's come before you, but to find your own voice. So what does jazz mean to you? Well, following on from the last you know, kind of piece, I think it is the, the, the need to have one foot in the past, to understand the origins, your own personal origins and the roots of the music, but the desire to keep driving forward and make something personal and individual as your statement. Um, but you know, jazz, if you want to talk about it specifically, relies on an inheritance of the blues, of the swing, a particular tradition, you know, and within that, as I mentioned, finding your own unique way of expressing yourself within this idiom. When did you start learning the sax? And why is it your instrument of choice? Um, I started on recorder actually, like a lot of primary school kids. Um, piano I played a little bit because my, my grandma had paid for some piano lessons for an um, organ church lady. Um, and then I, I went to play the clarinet when I was seven or eight years old. I moved to Birmingham and saw a saxophone for the first time when I was nine. And it was like, I, I've got to play this. <laughs> Dad cajoled him for many months to buy me one. Got a saxophone and from that point on really, the love of fed room was one of these things that sometimes it was tense, it was difficult because the instrument was quite heavy around the neck of a nine-year-old and sound awful, you know you sound awful. But I think it was when I was 13, I went to this building right behind us actually, the Symphony Hall and saw Winter Marsalis play. You know, and he was really encouraging. We snuck backstage, me and a young drummer friend of mine. And he was really encouraging. This made me feel like I could do anything. Like I deserved to discover this music and to learn it. And those kind of encounters with people, not just records, are the things that really switch on a light bulb. I'm glad that you encountered him because probably without him we wouldn't have seen the Soweto Kinch that we saw yesterday. Do you know what's crazy? I think that baton has been passed on for hundreds of years, yeah. long before there was anything called jazz. But I, I read stories about Louis Armstrong yeah. and Dizzy Gillespie, those two in particular, who would invite young musicians who were keen around to the house and Lucille, you know, yeah. Armstrong's wife would cook. Yeah. and the food and he'd sit down and show you things at the piano and encourage you and you know really be about passing on to subsequent generations and that's something that you really shouldn't lose i think i, I do bemoan the lack of that within him we're saying within mainstream culture i've seen it within artists like john for example, and others who are all about passing on and inspiring others to do the same thing better but there is within this capitalistic culture guarded kind of yeah. I'm a brand and I've got to protect myself I can't let anyone else come I'm going to step on their heels you know and jazz is not really about that it's so who 
who influenced you in jazz and who influenced you in MCing? Who are your favourites? Well, that's a big question right there. Um, I mean, we've already mentioned John Coltrane, yeah. Charlie Parker, Sonny Stick, the big, the big names, Ornette Coleman, um, Sonny Rollins, huge influence on me. Um, but some lesser known names in, from this country, Joe Harriet, Jamaican born artist who really exploded in this country in the 50s when he arrived in the late 50s. And it's, it's gone in peaks and troughs in terms of the recognition he's received, but he was a real visionary, a really futuristically minded cat, and someone who's hugely inspired as a jazz musician. In hip hop terms, man, the list is endless. You know, and for different things, for different reasons. I admire just the sheer MC and power and uh, force of a Buster Rhymes, or KRS One, uh, Chip Food, Bus Driver. Their sheer presence and dexterity uh, using their voice as an instrument, you know, and their pen as an instrument. Incredible. Um, you know, I admire MF Doom, and the intricacy of his writing, Wordsworth, the intricacy of his writing. You know I mean, and there's a whole new generation of battle MCs that I really admire as well. Something that I, as I said, uh, we were discussing before we even got into this. Something that I lament actually within the battle culture is that they don't make songs. You know, that's not their, that's not their focus. So, yeah, man, I think with time, this sub collide and get back to a cohesive culture. Because you did get some praise off Mo Steph as well, who is very, well, has actually done a jazz rap and stuff like that. Mm. Would you state him as one of your influences? Oh yeah, man, yeah. definitely. Yeah. That whole Black Star album, that whole yeah. movement, man. Yeah. Like, yeah. But you know, it's part of the native tongues. And when I was an 11 year old, the first day that I sold out, it was like, okay, you can be yourself, you can think outside the box. You know what I mean? That, that was a real light bulb moment musically for me. What was that, 1989? What about Jay Dilla for producing? Because it's, yeah. it's very much jazz. Yeah, I mean, I mean, all of those cats. Yeah. But they came along subsequently. You know? yeah. I'm just talking about the very first moment with, with the native tongues, with Tribe Called Quest, Dana Soul, Jungle Brothers. Like, they were not in the mainstream conception of what hip hop should look like. Yeah. They rejected the gold chains and yeah, the fat yeah. cars and, you know what I mean, the ice and the money. And, you know, it was about being yourself. They were labeled black hippies and stuff at the time. But that paved the way for artists like myself, for, for the far side, for, for Jay Dillow, who produced a lot of all that stuff, for Slump Village, all the subsequent artists that came and really revolutionized our conception of hip hop today. When did you feel you could play authentic and still get your point across? Um, it was a discovery. Actually, I think when I was hosting a jam session in Birmingham with a live box, right as a Zimbabwe born incredible British artist who had been to a while since I come and get some music. And I had some jazz material, I had some hip hop material, and I was like, maybe I should do two different sets, and maybe I shouldn't do the hip hop stuff, it might go over heads. And Esco was like, just, just do it. Just do it, let them make their minds up. Easier said than done, but I did that, and that was a big, like, aha. Uh -huh. preempt what they're going to be able to understand. You only have to take an experience like we had here at the Rep Theatre for the past two weeks with the legend of Mike Smith where there's some fairly elderly middle class white people coming to see the show and they're not alienated by the hip hop at all. If anything, some of the sections where I rolled out into the audience and started insulting people, they loved it. Yeah, I know. They no. really dug it. <laughs> you know, I think people respond to integrity and they respond to passion. And those things are well above any genre. How do you know that you had the trust in the crowd that you could do something like that? Go out into the crowd and interact with them? In I think I've been interacting with audiences for, for a while as, a, as an MC. I've been doing shows and freestyling and rapping with the crowd and enjoyed that banter. In terms of actually getting out into the crowd, yeah. that's something that's just grown really. And John ZD, the director, just encouraged me to get up in people's faces and not to be timid. It's something I'm still learning, like, what's the line? I've said some pretty, slightly offensive stuff to like older people in the crowd or girls in hijabs. I went in on the hijabs one night and I was like, I'm Mr. Politically Incorrect and they loved it. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? I think, uh, John Z made this point, quite provocative. He said, if there's a dude in a wheelchair, diss the guy in the wheelchair. <laughs> He's, he's, there's a crew that he worked with called Illability. The most amazing b-boys and a lot of them uh, amputees or wheelchair bound. And it's like, the one thing that irritates them the most is people going, oh, I can't 
say that. Yeah. We're part of the audience too. We're yeah. paid up members of society. We're capable of a lot more than you give us credit for. So don't discriminate. I'll diss the muscle bound, young, <laughs> cool looking dude. Then I'll diss the old woman. I'll, you know what I mean? I'll just go in because it's one audience. And that's a lesson I've learned actually quite recently. That I've got quite a lot of artistic license. People just enjoy being part of the show. Even if you're artistic, <laughs> really enjoy it. Yeah, that was quite innovative. But what chart tunes are your weaknesses? I don't know any chart tunes. Uh, I don't have any guilty pleasure pop stuff at the minute, really. I know I've checked out the more mainstream, what I call mainstream albums like Kanye and J. Cole yeah. and stuff. And, yeah, it's cool, man. Drake's got some skills here and there. Um, one thing I do find contrasting with artists like MF Doom. Artists who consistently push about boundaries is that you compare the discography to some of these artists that people are making a lot of fuss about. I like Kendrick Lamar, and I liked his mixtape stuff a lot more than the more recent stuff that's come out. But the diss track, as dope as it was, compared to some stuff that people were saying in the mid 90s, it ain't really all that hard. Yeah. Nas, when I was 12, I went to hell for smoking Jesus. Yeah. And this dude was 17 when he's back that first or something like that, real young. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I like Tyler the Creator and Odd Futures and they say some really offensive <laughs> great and stuff, but I think it's a twin prong thing in hip-hop to be innovative, to be conscious, to be elevatory, and to be real bass and offensive and guttural. It represents the full gamut of black expression you know, really, and that's why I love it. Like do you quite like the controversy? Is that what you say? I think I like the power of controversy. controversy. Um, I think I like the visceral discomfort that some moments you get in hip hop and certainly you get in theatre. But I also like it to have a, a purpose. You know I mean, sometimes you get annoyed at people just caught in controversy for the sake of it. You know I mean, oh, this is really offensive. And, oh, I mean, everyone throw up, baby. But what are you actually saying? I feel like there should be just personally a reason behind it. And there are some real uncomfortable moments, like, I just go to masturbation in the first, like, five minutes yeah. in the piece. Uh, yeah, internet porn. <laughs> but this shit's real, part of my friends. That's actually happening. So there's a reason to confront it, you know what I mean? And for everyone that's going, uh, they probably looking at it when the show is finished. So, like, I like those discom uncomfortable moments because they'll force people to confront things. You know what I mean? Uh, address things that need to be addressed. <laughs> I remember listening to Dave Chappelle quite recently and yeah. he was talking about Richard Pryor and the effect he had on him. You couldn't have a more open guy in terms of holding nothing back from the crowd. He spoke about everything from freebasing to shooting his car to, you know, yeah. working in a brothel. You know, it's the really hardcore stuff. But we accepted it because of his honesty, because of his purity and the gifting. So that's a lesson. It's a real lesson. Something else someone said to me recently, Martin Luther King lived another eight years after the I Have a Dream speech. Yeah. Think about that. It didn't kill him straight away. Yeah. Whoever killed him. Uh, you know, the fact of being able to be courageous, I think we've let some of that slide and become more cowardly in subsequent years. Do you think that that might be because um, you know, these, these greats have been killed for speaking like their minds. Uh, no, I think their legacy has been assassinated slowly. I think this is thing of like, well, we have equal rights now because Martin Luther King did the speech and civil rights happened. And Malcolm X, and we already did that, so move on. Yeah, okay, yeah. we've got a black president, so stop your whinging. The world's equal now. No, it's not, it's not the case. So a lot of us, I say collectively, us as black people, I say uh, poor people, I say inequalities, we don't challenge them as much because we feel, well, anyone can make it. And that's actually just a very popularized fiction. I had a song that I liked and loads of people liked it and millions of people bought it and it was popular, I'm not going to reject that. But um, I do, from some experience, have a sense that in order to get playlisted, in order to get that kind of exposure that it requires to have a hit record, there's a lot of machinations, a lot of puppeteering, a lot of compromises that one might have to make that I wouldn't necessarily have to make it. Um, and one can be tremendously successful without being famous. So I'll, I'll go for the success of the family. That's what it is. Thank you, Soweto Kent. Respect. <laughs> On the edge.